Thank you. One of the things is the, the rate at which believers from the global south are coming to North America and Europe is amazing. Some are coming as students, some are coming as professionals, but many of them are coming with just so much passion for God and they want to make a difference here when they come the same way they were making back home. How do you think the church in the global south can intentionally prepare believers, Christians, as they get ready to transition to other cultures so they are effective in the work that they come to do? You want me to start it? Yeah. Well, it still gets back to, well, there are many reasons why people come here. I think that the idea of trying to stop people from coming here is over. It's not going to work. People are going to come. I said to a friend of mine not too long ago, he, he's been a missionary, and he was actually born in Nigeria, and he came to visit, and we're talking about it. I said, you know, when your dad came to Nigeria, nobody ever asked them when they're going back. Why do I find people asking me when I'm going back? As, as though they don't want me. They're like, just get out of here, get out of here. I said, no. <laughs> For some of us, we came, you know, came here just to do something, get your education and get back home. The story changed. And if you submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus, you don't care what other people say. Eventually, it is what Jesus says that becomes the ultimate uh, focus for you. And so sometimes we have that pushback where people say, what is this person coming here to do again? Are you sure you're going to go back? And you're like, yes, of course, I'm going back. Now you're not going back. And somebody is angry because you're not going back. But they're not angry when other religion people come. They're not angry when uh, the, what is they call M M12 or M something? Those people, cult people in uh, South America, they don't, yeah. they don't, they don't get angry with those ones, but they get angry when the pastor doesn't go back. So, but let's leave those people aside and see that they are very ignorant or maybe proud. Uh, so let's leave those ones aside. But I think that when people are coming here, they have to know they are coming to a different environment and they are strangers. And so when you're a stranger, there's a saying in my part of Nigeria, they say that when a chicken, a native chicken gets to a new destination and you put it on the ground, <laughs> it lifts one leg up and put the other on the ground and looks around to be sure he's in safe zone before he puts the second leg down. So, so I think that I, I will I will argue that people have to do that. Don't assume that you have come to your hometown or your home country. So the pastors may be the people who need to do that preparation. Or for those of us who are already here, when we go home and we hear about people who want to come here, spend time with them to mentor them. Tell them, you know, there are so many things. I remember someone, uh, that story, I don't know if some of you still remember, someone was in at a seminary in Kentucky and was exhausted in the sun, the heat of May or June and collapsed. And I have these two Nigerians who came to leave, spend holiday with me. They rushed down there, they're laying hands and they're praying, speaking in tongue on this guy. This guy is exhausted. They, in, in, in Kentucky, they were supposed to call 911 and they will come get this guy and take care of him. But the first instinct was to, hold this guy down. They didn't call anybody. They are speaking in tongue and praying and laying hands. And when they came back to me and told me this, I wasn't around. I said, God saved you. You will have been arrested. Obstruction. If something had happened to that guy, you will be in trouble. The first thing to do is to call 911. You may begin to pray and speak in tongue. That's fine. But first call the 911. You know, so people not knowing that. I had a student here who drove a car. He's been driving in Nigeria. He came, got a car and drove. He doesn't have a driver's license. He doesn't have an insurance for the car. He's yeah. driving. The police was behind him and he intensified his speed. And then they started chasing him. He ran out of the town and was running on the highway. And they chased him for 35 miles, three cars. They had to throw something on his, on his car overtake him and throw, and the car rolled over for them to get him, got him to the hospital and then got him to jail. When I went to bail him at the jail, I asked him a question, where do you think you were going? Because it's, it takes, from my part of Nebraska to the end of Nebraska, it's about nine hours drive. And I said to him, "There will be your gas is, you're gonna be out of gas. 
So do you think you're in Nigeria where when the police chases you for like 10, 15 minutes, they don't have enough gas, so they will leave you alone, hoping to get you another day? I said, it doesn't happen around here. So I think that if he had had some orientation to say, you know, when the, the car of the police is behind you, you just have to stop where he comes from in my part of Nigeria, the police comes in front of you, not at their back. And they pull out their gun and cock the gun, point it at you. Then you know you have to stop. But here, they don't do that. They are behind you and they put on their light, hoping that you park and pull over and stop. So these are little, little things that can get people into trouble. So I think that helping to mentor those kind of people, letting them know that God is sending them here, but they have to first learn, just like Jesus staying for 30 years, learning the culture, the customs, before he then eventually came out to talk about the spirit of God is upon me and all those things. The spirit has always been on him. Uh, but, you know, he. the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, he went home with his parents and became subject to them. And I think it's important that people have to become subject to whatever culture that they go to. And they have to prepare that before they go out to say, okay, where am I going to? What are some of the things? What are the things I need to learn about the churches there? Don't just say, oh, all these churches are too dry. They are dead because they don't jump and dance and sweat. It means they are dead. It doesn't really mean so because sweating is not is not equal to the spirit, even though many parts of Africa, we equate it for it, but that's not true. There are, people could be sweating and the spirit is not there. <laughs> and we can go to a place where people are singing their hymns quietly and we can feel the spirit of God there. And so learning those things may be very helpful for people who are coming in here so that they, they don't become too zealous or overzealous and pushing people away from them. Okay, I'm preaching now. No, that's good. That's good stuff. <laughs> Susan, you have some extras to add? Gosh. <laughs> I, I just wanted to push back on Tunde and say, you have to sweat for the spirit to be on you, brother. What what kind of doctrine is that? <laughs> I don't mean you can't sweat. I just, now. I just no, don't you don't stand to... still and tell us there is any spirit in you. No, the spirit okay? can move you to so... quietness. It can make you calm. It can be a still, small voice. We mustn't be dancing and sweating and rolling on the ground every time <laughs> because that happens with the masquerades in my village and, they are not, and the Holy Spirit is not upon them. They sweat and they dance and they roll on the ground. I just want people to remember that. <laughs> just messing up with my Pentecostal brother. Anyway, um, yeah, I think I think those things that you're saying are very very accurate. <clears throat> um, in fact, I had a call from a friend recently, and they told me how they had been driving through town, and a police officer was following them. <clears throat> and they thought the guy is on his way to something. But then whenever they turned, the police turned too. And so they decided to go to a different route because they weren't even sure what this guy is up to. And they went in circles and circles and circles and the guy kept following. And so she started racing across town and the policeman started racing across town and when they finally stopped, the of course, the police officer was not smiling. And so he came out and they were shouting and they thought maybe it was a drugs person or something cuffed her. Um, she had a little baby at home. So, um, yeah, but they took her in. It, it took uh, a lot of intervention from um people around to say no 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 this is a, this is not who you think it is this is just an innocent person who wasn't anyway so th those are very important uh, i think the only thing i can add to that is, is um how the churches can prepare people coming here. So I understand that not everybody coming here is a pastor. Not everybody coming here is officially a missionary, uh, but people are coming here as believers and lovers of Christ. I think 
uh, it's important for um, churches to remind them that um, to be a witness of Christ, you do not need to be trained theologically. You do, you do not need to um, be endowed with great wisdom and philosophical arguments. You just need to be willing to share your story about who Jesus is to you. And I think that's what happened in the early church. They just shared their story. They said, there is this guy, guys, you need to check him out because he is awesome and that's how the gospel spread i think i think many times people feel inadequate you know like how much do i know um how can i engage these learned and smart people in in this conversation without realizing that it's really not about well, I mean, it, it matters what we say, but that is not it. It's about the spirit of God living in us. He's the one who does the convicting. Um, he's the one who um, uh, convicts people of sin and judgment. Um, and so ours is just to share our story and who Jesus is and what he has done to us. I think another faulty um, understanding that has been there uh, in Yester years is that to do missions, you have to come from um, a place of those who have to a place of those who don't. And so we, you know, we had people who passed for mission projects. This one looks like one we can give. And it that's not how it needs to be. Um Mission is not so much about giving stuff as it is about sharing, um, sharing, you know, who we have come to experience in Christ. And so encouraging people to just come share your story with everybody you meet. Um, don't get into arguments. You won't win those. But be attentive to the prompting of the spirit um, and just share what God gives you to share with people. Okay. I'm going to ask this last question and then I'm going to let you both just give your last final thoughts. Uh, looking at the body of Christ in America, and that includes everybody, the Native Americans, the Caucasians, the African Americans, and those from the diaspora living here. I believe that the church is so gifted with the resources. How can the church benefit from what it has, its diversity to, to become a stronger missions force back into the world. Well, I, I would say that everyone has something to offer. And the church, when well, we use a church now in this general sense in, in the US and in the West in general, should know that they have a lot so, so that you're not just projecting one aspect of yourself. And I am uh, I'm not a fan of the diversity, whatever they call it, uh, diversity, equity, and all those stuff. Those are just, those are just for me, are just social cliches or political whatever. I've I've had people who put that at their doorposts and their wherever you get in, you still feel so discriminated. You still feel they want to use you to achieve something. So I, th I think let's leave that aside and ask the question. This is a bowl of, I did a paper not too long ago. This is a bowl of fruit with different types of fruits and colors. And the, the doctors and the nutritionists have told us that we should always try to take all these colors and mix them together to have a balanced diet of fruit. I, I, if we use that principle, that is what we should be able to do in America. Rather than some people say, oh, these people have come. What are they coming here to do? Is to say, oh, we welcome the gift that they bring. And how can we integrate that gift? Uh, I, I, I was, I'm, my ordination is in the Anglican church. And it's, it's been a war for the past few years between the African church of North America 
and the Anglican Church, Church of Nigeria. Because Church of Nigeria wants to have his own stuff, wants to do his own outreach, reach out to his own people, sing their language, dance their stuff, and be happy with themselves, stay in their comfort zone. The Anglican Church of North America are saying, come on, we want you to be part of us. But the Nigerians are like, well, you want us to be part of you, but you don't want us to have equal voice and equal everything. We feel discriminated, so we want to go our own way and do our own stuff. And what is that? There is friction. There is disagreement. And the mission of Christ is left unattended to while all this politics is going on. So I think that if the church can sit down and say, God has brought us to a time like this, let's take all these gifts together. Let's integrate them or bring them together, whatever name you want to use, whether you want to use the mosaic, whether you want to use the melting pot, I don't care. I just want you to use all these things, put them together because they have a purpose and then sit down and coordinate it properly and use it to then bless the rest of the world. I think that would be a very good thing. That is not happening yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think there is beauty in diversity. There is beauty in difference in, in um having all those giftings from different cultures and different ethnicities. Um I think it's in the book of Corinthians that Paul talks about different parts of the body. Um, and so there's the eyes and there's the mouth and there is the ears. Um and you know, an eye can't think of itself so great and say, I am sufficient for the body and, and I'm I'm going to be the body by myself. Mm. No, you, you can't breathe as an eye. You can't hear as an eye. You can't eat food as an eye. You need everybody else. And so I'm thinking there was wisdom when God was making all of us like this. And we should just embrace each other. The health of the church depends on us embracing and accepting our brothers and sisters from other parts of the world and realizing that God has gifted us differently for the edification of the church. It is actually for our nourishment and not for our undoing. I think our undoing is when we start thinking one group my group is better suited to do this than everybody else. That's so, so good, man. I'm going to let you all give your final thoughts uh, on what it means to be on missions in the diaspora or just any thoughts that come to your mind from just all these conversations. And uh, we will wrap it and give it a day. Anybody wants to go first? We are in the last days. I always tell people that of course, that continues. By the time we are dead and the new generation will come up, they will still be in the last days. So, but it is very exciting to be born and to be alive at a time like this, where the barriers have been broken down, technological wise, transportation wise, and the rest of it. And so it's time to allow the Holy Spirit to use the different parts of the body of Christ walking together, I, I talked the other day talking with someone about partnership. And I said, when I says partnership, I know where you're going to. I said, don't go there. I said, it's not about sending money to anywhere. That's not what I'm talking about. You know, if we want to use Paul Hebert's language, using the hermeneutical community, where we're all together, you know, working together. And I said, it's not about just asking people and putting some black people in the midst of some white people or have all these black people and sandwich one white person and say, now nah, that's diversity. I said, no, no, we're just, that's playing into the gallery. Real working together will happen when we learn to accept the body of Christ, like Susan talked about, and not just enduring one another, but enjoying one yeah. another, whereby people bring their stuff with their various accent, Wonderful. They are singing in the various languages and we're appreciating them. We're not just taking selfie and videos like people do every time that say they are doing worship. I say, what kind of worship are you doing that you're still comfortable taking videos up and down? Oh, I like how they are dancing. That's just, you're just doing social, social media stuff. You're not worshiping. When people are really worshiping, they forget about their 
photographs and cameras, they're just lost. Or like someone said, oh, we're praying. And somebody is videoing you praying on the mountain. You're not yet praying. That's not how to pray. So I, th I think we have to leave all those, all those virtual signaling, is that what they call it? And sit down, you know, and do the real stuff. Enjoy one another. Listen to each other's story. Visit with one another. I'm yet to, I know some people must have told you, oh, I would like to visit with you in your country. That's just talk. When you mean it, I know when you really mean it. And then we can travel. It's not about bringing money. That's You're not doing any project. You're not building any houses. Just come and see how people worship in that culture and come back and be encouraged. I think when we start doing that, we're, we're enjoying one another. And once we're able to do that, it becomes easier for us to then work together. And what Susan was talking about, we can achieve it if we are willing to have it. And this is our opportunity. In, in the diaspora, we have a lot of mission work to do. The gospel needs to go around. Many people, I'm surprised. Each time I talk to people who, who were raised in the US, some of them have never been to churches before. Some of them only went to church during a funeral service. You know, I'm like, I didn't know you, you're so ignorant like this, you know, even around you. So I think we have opportunities but we can only do that when we learn from the community where we are and then give to that community the way they will want to be helped. You know, we won't force our cultures on them to force them to come pray six hours or you must do five hours of worship because that's what we do back home in Africa. No, we need to respect people and then bring the gift that we have to them. And it's going to be a great time of harvest. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, Reverend Susan. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I think Tunde has said everything, honestly. Um, I'll just add and say, I think God is unto something beautiful in our age. Um, with this advancement of technology and communities coming together, God is unto something beautiful. It's up to the church to embrace what everybody brings um, and without pride, you know, if if the Western church is endowed with resources, share it with others without feeling like, oh, look, look at those poor people, we have to go and help them. No, with an attitude of God has blessed us with this, we are going to share it with our brothers and sisters from other parts of the world who need this. And if it's the gift of prayer, I have always enjoyed how my Asian brothers and sisters, especially from Korea, are so disciplined about their prayer life. Like Tunde was talking about waking up at 5 a.m. and going for prayer. Bring that and share it with the international church. Let the church wake up to pray, you know. And if if maybe the Nigerians have the gift of community where everybody together embraces each other, Bring that and share it with others, not with judgment and condemnation, but just yeah. with, oh, we are happy to share with you this aspect of Christianity. Like Andrew Walls, I think um, in his book, um, um, okay, I won't remember, but uh, in one of his books, he shares about how this missionary who was going and coming back and going and coming back after every 50 years and meeting different expressions of faith mm. and then realized, oh gosh, it's not one thing. It's all these things together. Mm -hmm. And so the beauty of what we have right now is that this missionary this terrestrial missionary that Andrew Wall was imagining does not have to go back 50 years to come and witness something different. It's all here. So yeah. let's share this because this can only be for the benefit mm. of God's kingdom. Amen. Yes. And, oh my. Woo! I felt like jumping and starting a yes. prayer meeting. This has been so awesome. Thank you both so much for sharing your wisdom. I believe that this is going to bless someone. Uh, but one thing I want to say, there might be somebody who jumps to this video and does not even have a relationship with God and doesn't even know what it means like to be in a relationship. So everything that they are listening is going to be above their head. Would any of you want to just lead them to Christ? Just tell them what does it mean to come to have a relationship with Jesus so they understand everything else 
about missions. I'll let the right reverend, um, Doctor okay. Babatunde or Ladimeji, do that. No, I I, I think that there, there's no formula about it, but I think that if you want to have a relationship with Jesus, He's already waiting for you. He said, "I do." More than two thousand years ago, when He stretched Himself on the cross, and to die for your sin and for my sin, and all we need to do at this point is to say our own I do to what he has said. So and the way, best way to do that is to accept him in your heart that he died for you and put your faith in him and uh, receive him as Lord. And I can pray together with you today if you want to pray with me and you can just uh, reflect and you can say these words, they're not magical words, but they're just kind of giving you a language uh, by saying, uh, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge myself as a sinner. and I know that you died for me on the cross of Calvary. I put my faith in you and I accept your offer of salvation. And I accept you as the Lord of my life. To live my life for you and to do your will. In Jesus name, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone today who is listening to us and who has been touched by some of the talks that we've had, but they don't have a genuine relationship with you or they used to have, and now they've departed from you and they want to come back home to say, I do to you. We pray together, three of us, putting our faith together and asking that your grace will be revealed to them and that they, as they open their hearts to you, that the Holy Spirit will do his work in them as they accept you writing their names in the book of life, giving them eternal life as they make you their Lord of their lives. So we give you praise and we give you thanks because we have asked in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow, thank you. That's going to be a wrap for today, guys. If you like this, share it with someone, subscribe to this channel and goodbye. See you next time. Bye. Okay, stop your recording.